<laughs> so thank you also for uh, asking me to speak about children because I think very often we don't hear what children are saying. Um, and my grandfather, long since deceased, used to say to me all the time, because I'm a bit of a chatterbox, you have two ears and one mouth. So you should listen twice as much as you talk. So if you all go out of here listening more and talking less, and particularly listening to children, I think that would be great. So if you went out of here now and you went to Disneyland and you asked all of the children in the queue waiting to see Mickey about bleeding, they would probably... Ooh, they would probably talk about something like this. So regular children, children that don't have a bleeding disorder, when they talk about bleeding, they talk about blood, they talk about red, they talk about nosebleeds, they talk about falling over and cutting themselves. And that is very different from what happens with the children that we look after in the world of haemophilia and bleeding disorders. So the red visible trauma, not very often bleeding, that gets better with a plaster or a band-aid is what children without bleeding disorders would describe about, having, uh, about bleeding. So what about children with a bleeding disorder? I'm going to show you a little bit about um, some, my research that I did for my PhD, which I started in 2010. Um, and it was called Haemophilia 2010 because that was a really innovative um, title for it. So um, children at Great Ormond Street, which is where I work, um, are all, all the boys with severe haemophilia on prophylaxis. And they're all, from my perspective, out there leading as normal a life as they can. So they're having high-dose, intensive prophylaxis, they're playing football, they're running around being essentially normal, whatever normal is, and they all show really good scores on quality of life assessment tools. And yet when you talk to them, they moan and groan about having haemophilia. It's horrible, they hate the injections, it's ruined their life, it's awful. And I thought that's really interesting. So what is it that is different from the child's perspective to the treater's perspective? Given that we all think they're having a great time, this is the best time ever to have haemophilia, isn't it? Um, probably not from their perspective. So I thought I'd look at that a little bit more. And so I used a grounded theory study to explore the feelings of boys with haemophilia aged 4 to 16, so quite a large age range, um, and used multiple age-appropriate methods to uh, understand the different ages of the children and how they could explain themselves. Uh, I can go back on. So in grounded theory, you don't go out with a hypothesis. You go out to talk to patients, to interview patients, people with haemophilia, bleeding disorders, whoever your, your study group is, to find out what it is like to be them. So you start off with your very first interview with a few questions, like tell me what it's like to be in this room today, and then you'll tell me something, and I'll say, oh, that's quite interesting. And then so the next person that you interview, you'll say, tell me what it's like to be here today, but somebody else told me this. Has that ever happened to you? So it's an unusual research methodology for probably most of you in the room, uh, very much used in social science, uh, and usually used with difficult to get to groups of people, so people that don't normally fill in questionnaires, don't usually come to clinic very often, um, and those that are challenging in some way to get views out of. So if you gave a questionnaire to a four-year-old and said, fill this in, you probably would get no questions back. If you sit down with them on the floor and you draw or you tell a story or you colour something in, you'll hear back from them about what it is like to be them. And so we used four methods uh, throughout the study. The first was something called photo elicitation, which is where you give a camera to a child or a person and ask them to take photographs of what's happened to them in a, a time period. So for this, the boys had two weeks. Uh, they had a digital camera, and we thought we'd do something really clever and actually download the photographs and print them with them at home uh, when we went to talk to them about what photos they'd taken. So my pilot uh, young patient uh, was about eight. He had his camera for two weeks. I went to download the photos and print them out with them, and he'd taken 496 photographs. So you can imagine that would take quite a long time to print and to talk about. Uh, and so we changed the methodology after the first person had been through, because that clearly wasn't going to work. Uh, and so we asked the mums to print the photographs for us in a photo um, shop. 
Uh, and then we talked to the children about the photos that they had got, but they still hadn't seen them before the day that we got there to do the, the, the talking to them. And then we asked them to pick out their 10 most important photographs out of the ones that they'd taken and to talk about why they'd taken those photos. And they had taken photographs of all kinds of things that were really important to them that you would never know in clinic. So photographs of things at home, cuddly toys, photographs of their friends at school, going to camp, the bus stop, things that really were important to them. We used that for the smallest children, so the four to, uh, four to eight-ish year olds. And then for the slightly older children, we got them to write a story or draw a picture and tell us about what had happened to them in the previous two weeks. We did some individual interviews with some of the older boys, uh, just talking about what it was like to have haemophilia and what they'd done over the last couple of weeks. And then for the oldest group, uh, we got them together in focus groups. So they all shared experience about what it was like to have haemophilia for them. But they also were then starting to share their stories. And I think that's something we're not so good at these days because most haemophilia care is now delivered at home by individual families. So if you have nobody else in your family with haemophilia, you don't have the, the shared experience that perhaps older patients had when they met in hospital much more often. So I've already told you I had no hypothesis. I just went out there to talk to children to find out about what it's like to have haemophilia now. We did um, the, some recordings. I was out in the children's homes every, once a week or twice a week, talking to children, all digitally recorded, sitting in the car park of the nearest supermarket after the interview, listening to it again, writing down thoughts and thinking, not really getting very far. It's all lovely, but not much is happening. After each interview, we were analyzing the data. There were three of us analyzing the data, so it wasn't just me, and thinking about the things that the patient, to children had said that we might be able to pick out to ask subsequent children, all going along, all very kind of nice, but not much happening. And then the eureka moment happened. And on the next slide, we've got a drawing that was done by Tom. Or well, for the purposes of this talk, it's called Tom. So he was about 12. Um, he had a younger brother who also had haemophilia, a sister, and him and his mum at home. And he had drawn this picture um, and showed the dichotomy of having haemophilia. So there's good things about haemophilia, he said, and there's bad things about haemophilia. So you can see over here on the good things, he'd just been away on a haemophilia society event, he'd been playing football, he'd been on a zip wire, and he'd been kayaking or canoeing. So you think that's all great. And this is where analyzing children's drawings can go wrong. So you think this is bad because of the injection. Would you all think that? Wrong. So he says doing this is not bad because doing this, doing your factor, doing your infusions, means you can do all the good things. The reason he's crying in this picture is because he's got a knee bleed. So he says that having a bleed, having pain, having, as like David's just said, makes you remember you've got haemophilia. And I think for a lot of children in the UK, they don't really remember haemophilia. They just have their infusions regularly. They don't bleed very often. And they forget the complications of haemophilia. And if he had a bleed, he wouldn't be able to do any of these good things. And that's what made him sad. So after that, we had this... Hurrah, we found the answer and recoded all of the data and then went on to ask uh, children in the subsequent uh, interviews what's a good thing about having haemophilia and what's a bad thing about haemophilia or what's a good day, what's a bad day. And then after 30 more interviews, we got to a point where we were getting no new information from any of the participants and so we stopped uh, questionnaireing and, and, and in interviewing them all. So they told us amazing things. They told us... Lots of things about genetics and inheritance. They understood how they got haemophilia. They understood what it meant when they had children. They understood if they knew their sisters were carriers, what it meant for their children. And they said really altruistic things like, I'm glad I've got haemophilia because if my sister has a baby with haemophilia, I will be able to help him in the future. So some really lovely things came out of, of what it's like to grow up with haemophilia now with those boys thinking about the future. That's all very interesting because actually we're not probably very good about teaching genetics to the boys with haemophilia when they come to clinic. So we might have told the parents at the time of diagnosis, this is how your baby got haemophilia, and we kind of assume that the boys soak up that information, and, may, and it shows that probably they do. 
They also talked a lot about how important family was for them in terms of social support, how important school was for them in terms of having friends, and how important sport was, because that's a real marker of your masculinity. If you can play football, you can play cricket, you can run, you can join in with all the other boys, then you are like they are. You're not different. Uh, a lot of them talked about um, life with haemophilia as making them the people that they are and that they didn't necessarily want to get rid of haemophilia if the cure came, if the gene therapy came or whatever. Some of them were fairly happy to stay having haemophilia because it made them the people they were. They talked a little bit about adolescence and career options, and they also talked about how important social support was globally for them. But also, really importantly, they talked about bleeds and treatment. And David just said something about age and how age helps you to understand your bleeding. So if you're a child that's had him, um, a prophylaxis from the very beginning, you maybe don't have that experience. And one of my boys came into clinic not that long ago, about aged about four, and he ran into the haemophilia center, shouting at the top of his voice, it's a bleed, it's a bleed, it's my knee. And I was like, it doesn't look like your knee to me. And he was holding his elbow. So aged four, he knew he had a bleed, but he didn't know the difference between his knee and his elbow. So I think we sometimes forget that children very early on know when something is wrong and they can tell you it's a bleed because they use the medical terms that we use. They're not talking about bleeding, seeing red stuff like uh, children at Disney might be. Thanks. Next one. So overall, after the whole study, um, the data sort of came into two groups of data. So there was something around developing self-awareness and management skills, and that included um, being able to reconstitute their factor, being able to understand the principles of prophylaxis, self-management skills, and genetics, and then something around being a young person and a social actor, so interacting with other people. And we all do that every day. It's a very kind of anthropological term, but you are all at the moment social actors, and you're in a social relationship with the person sitting next to you. Um, and that includes social support, quality of life, sport and social networking. So how do children and young people develop self-awareness and management skills? So if you think about the, the children that you maybe treat in your centers, it's probably the mum that does 99.9% .9 of the care, you think. But what the boys tell us is that they can develop these skills themselves, even though they're very happy to put their arm out and let their mum do their treatment, because they're boys. Why would they get out of bed 10 minutes earlier to mix their factor, infuse themselves, sorry, David, when their mum could do it for them and they can have that extra 10 minutes in bed? Particularly if you're an adolescent. So those of you that have got adolescent children in your house or have had them will know they don't get out of bed at 8 o'clock in the morning to do breakfast, brush their teeth, do their factor, iron their school shirt, go to school on time. They're, they're very good at staying in bed as long as they can. They know how to recognize a bleed and they know when they're getting a bleed. So some of the things that David described earlier about the feeling that they have, whether they know something's happening. Um, and when they recognize that, they know it's a bleed. They're quite good at making sure that they treat themselves now because these are a bunch of children who've got easy access to treatment and want to be able to carry on playing football or going out at the weekends. They don't want to ignore it and not be able to go out later. Next one, Paul. So this is a quote from a 14-year-old who says, haemophilia is something that only happens when you get hit or something. So he was a boy that was having regular prophylaxis and really having very, very few breakthrough bleeds. And if you get a bleed, you just bleed a little bit more than an average person. It's not really a big deal if you've got access to treatment. Next one. And self-infusion, I stick the needle in, it feels a bit weird. So actually, if you're a haemophilia treater in the audience, have you ever tried to infuse yourself with anything? I shouldn't suggest that you go and get 10 mils of saline and try and inject yourself, but actually it's really difficult. And yet we're expecting very small children to be able to do that with only one hand. Maybe not all of the physical and cognitive skills that they need to be able to do it, but they are learning and they are doing it. And they're also thinking about how their factor works. There's some basic understanding here of pharmacology and pharmacokinetics. So if you think about your factor levels like a graph, there's some ups when you've treated yourself, some downs when you're due treatment. But you know if you're on a level somewhere, you won't get hurt as much if you're in, in, a, in an accident or you, you twist your knee as you fall down the stairs. So we all at this meeting have heard lots and lots about adherence and how awful adolescents are because they don't do it, but I think I'd like to prove you slightly wrong. 
because lots of the boys in this study talked about prophylaxis and said it keeps their bleeds at bay and so they do it daily or every other day because if they don't do it they feel a bit strange and this is one boy who said if I don't do my daily treatment I feel a bit weird I don't feel quite so alive and quite so decent so whether that was something about him being anxious about having a bleed or whether actually prophylaxis physically gave him a sense of security David you maybe comment um, he obviously wanted to carry on with his prophylaxis forever never wanted to stop felt much better when he was having it and a few of the boys in this study were on daily treatment rather than every other day and they liked doing that because they had a routine so they would get up in the morning clean their teeth do their factor and it meant that they knew what their factor levels were this is a nice quote that says if you get smashed up so if you get an injury maybe in a little scuffle in the playground at school a bit of a fight you know you're not going to get injured as much as you would if you weren't um, doing your treatment and I like it daily because I get up and do it and I'm ready for school so these are not non-adherent children by any means at all. They're great social actors, that's why, because these are boys who've grown up in an, a world and an environment where they've had loads of access to treatment so they can go out there and do everything that everybody else does. They can only do that, though, if they've got great social support, and that changes and develops over time. So if you think about very small children, they have a very family-focused environment. So the whole of their social support network is parents, siblings, and their extended family. At this point in time, if we're talking about bleeding, people know they've got haemophilia in their family. People will be keeping a closer eye on them, and they're probably the most protected as they're ever going to be in their life. When they move towards school, they develop peer groups, and at some point they've got to tell somebody in school that they've got haemophilia, or somebody has got to tell somebody in the school they've got haemophilia. And one of the boys that I interviewed who was about eight was really cross that people in his school had found out he had haemophilia because he'd never told his friends before, and because his mum had been to the school and told the teacher, and the teacher had told somebody else, and somebody else had told somebody else, it got out. And so it wasn't his haemophilia anymore, it was everybody's haemophilia. And suddenly there was much more focus on him, making sure he was okay, could he sit on that chair? And he actually admitted that he'd never been able to sit on the floor at school during um, assembly, like every other child did, they were all sitting on the floor with their legs crossed. He'd been made to sit at the front with the teachers on a proper chair because they were worried that he was going to get a knee bleed. So that made him completely different from everybody else and he didn't like it. And then, of course, at adolescence, you're going out there, pushing the boundaries, becoming independent, forming those long-term relationships with girlfriends, perhaps, and having to reveal that you've got haemophilia and what that might mean for your children in the future if you ended up marrying that girl. Um, you might have you know, girls who are carriers. And actually, for some of the sisters of these boys, there's a real focus on having, potentially having babies with haemophilia, but that's a whole other talk. They like the shared knowledge and understanding from haemophilia, I've said this already, about um, knowing about their carrier sisters, knowing that they'll be there in the future to help future generations of people with haemophilia. And that's great if you're in a family. Um, and as I said earlier, the family used to be, for patients, much more than your immediate biological family. So you used to have um, people who you could get support from that who were not your biological family, but were somehow your haemophilia family. So this is a picture of a child at Great Ormond Street in the 1900s, uh, and he had a disease of the right knee. So he might have had haemophilia, he might not have done. But if you think back to how haemophilia care in the UK was 40, 50 years ago, people with haemophilia came into hospital a lot. They were inpatients, they developed relationships with each other, and they were great social support to each other as children. And I still see that in the older men with haemophilia now, that they are supporting each other through social networks, through social media, at haemophilia society events. If we look at the young boys now, they're not having that kind of relationship. They're very much more out there on their own, trying to lead normal lives and do normal things. And mostly that is fine, and mostly it works. But for some, they do need some support of others with haemophilia. And it's quite difficult sometimes with all of the data protection rules to put patients in contact with each other. Um, and one of my boys who recently transitioned to an adult uh, centre came back and said, it's great, I met somebody with haemophilia today. And I was like, okay. And it's, he'd met somebody in the waiting room and talked to them and said, this is my name, I'm new here and I've got haemophilia. And this other person said, oh, I've got haemophilia too. 
And so I then said to him, but what about, you know, Charlie and Fred and Tom and Dick and Harry? And he said, well, they haven't got haemophilia. But they were people that he'd sat in the waiting room at my hospital with for years and years and years. But because we'd never said, he's got haemophilia just like you, he hadn't ever worked that out. So that's a great thing in terms of the success of the treatment, but actually it's not a great thing in terms of success of supporting young people. So in conclusion, children probably know far more about uh, having a bleeding disorder than we give them credit for, and they certainly know when they've got to bleed, and we should listen to them. And the, we should also talk to them more about pain, because we're probably not very good at assessing pain when they come in in a non-bleeding situation. So if you come in with a bleed, we'll treat you, we'll give you some analgesia, but if you come back two days later, we're probably not saying how good is your pain today and can we do something about it. We probably don't ask them the right questions when they come to clinics. We focus very much on the medical model. When did you do your prophylaxis? What's your trough level? Are you doing the right thing? But we don't actually talk to them about can they talk to somebody else about haemophilia? Do they want to? Do they need somebody else they can talk to? Maybe some psychological support. What else can we learn from them? Absolutely loads. <laughs> we can, no, no, go back, go back. So we can learn about um, non-severe haemophilia. So all my research so far has been with children with severe haemophilia. So I'm sure it's different if you haven't got severe haemophilia. What if you've got about an inhibitor, another bleeding disorder? What if you're a girl with a bleeding disorder? They're very, very underrepresented in anything that we ever see published or written about or talked about. Carriers, known and potential. As children, how do we deal with them? So if your dad has got haemophilia, do we talk to you age six, seven, eight about what that means for you? There's a whole world of research opportunities out there that everybody could join in with. And I think I could stand up here and say, we've cracked it. It's marvelous. We can talk to all these children. We understand everything about them. We can make it better for them. But we need to remember that out there in the world, there are lots and lots and lots of children who aren't even getting a diagnosis. So tell me what this little boy might say about living with haemophilia. He's a little boy in Uganda, which is where I'm twinned with at the moment, and you can see that he has no access to treatment. You can see from the picture that he lives in a very rural community, so he has no electricity, so he can't even use ice. Think anybody talks to him about his pain? No. He doesn't go anywhere. The one thing he would like to do is go to school. So how can we help him do that? So we need to talk to children in developing countries probably much more than we do children in developed countries because their needs are probably far greater. So thank you all very much.